But I think what we need to do is step back and just apply a little more skepticism about the ability of these complex statistical models embedded with assumptions to really capture reality. I think they, they tend to be tools for, frankly, controlling the population, uh, whether sure. you're talking about the pandemic or the election, rather than tools to accurately model reality. And that's that's the problem because we think, look, the lockdowns happen more or less because of this belief that these models represented reality. And so it's as if we cut off our heads to get rid of a headache. There would have been a much more focused strategy that would have been much better with fewer consequences if we'd focused on the population that was most at risk. It's my pleasure to welcome J.W. Richards. He is a professor at the Bush School of Business and a fellow of the Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America. He's located in the Washington, D.C. area. He's a senior fellow at the Discovery Institute and executive editor of The Stream. He is also the creator and executive producer of acclaimed PBS documentaries, The Call of the Entrepreneur, The Birth of Freedom, and The privileged planet. He's the author of several New York Times bestselling books, including three that we're going to try and touch on today. One is The Human Advantage, The Future of American Work in the Age of Smart Machines. You know, we've talked a lot about automation over the years, and so we'll dive into that topic a bit. And Infiltrated, How to Stop the Insiders and Activists Who Are Exploiting the Financial Crisis to Control Our Lives and Our Fortunes. And the new book, The Price of Panic, How the Tyranny of Experts Turned a Pandemic into a Catastrophe. Jay, welcome. How are you? Just fine. Thanks so much for having me, Jason. Good. It's good to have you. And you've got quite a resume. So we're looking forward to learning some good stuff today. Let's start maybe with your latest book, The Price of Panic. And, you know, that one is is really topical given what's going on, you know, whether it be the election, the pandemic, yep. the riots, and, you know, the affiliated financial crises. What's the general thesis of that book? The general thesis of the book is that um, the the pandemic, of course, and the coronavirus is a real thing, but that it was made vastly worse by the way in which we responded to it. And so what happened is uh, effectively we had uh, we have a coronavirus that uh, for people that are under age 60 is about as dangerous as the flu. If you're if you're just under 20, it's actually about four times less dangerous than the flu, and it's more dangerous if you're over 70. So it was, it's not a historic virus or a historic pandemic. It's something like the Hong Kong flu of 1968, and yet it's the first time in human history that the entire world shut itself down. I mean, just literally population-wide lockdowns, which have never been tried before. And that's why we talk about the price of panic, because we think this is a, a weird convergence of factors in which you have... First, this idea of population-wide lockdowns sort of resting as a hypothesis waiting to be tested uh, in the public health sort of bureaucracies around the world. Uh, you have now the kind of real-time access to social media and media, which tends to, to panic us, unfortunately. And, as, and then these speculative computer models that um, made predictions about how deadly the virus was supposed to be that turned out not to be true. So you had this model at the Imperial College London at the end of March, which claimed the virus was going to have about a 3.4% infection fatality rate. That's where we got these numbers, about 50 million dead and 2.2 million Americans dead. Well, we knew almost immediately that that was off by orders of magnitude, just completely off. Unfortunately, that was what inspired the World Health Organization and the CDC uh, to order the lockdowns was this prediction. Um, and it, this actually connects, strangely enough, to what we're, you know, the, the, the debate over um, the current election. The, the the public opinion polls and the voter polls, all of which claimed uh, that it was going to be a Biden sweep, you know, the different polls that had him 8, 10, 11 points ahead. They're all based on these speculative computer models, these statistical models. And, and by the way, at the um, time of this recording, it's the day after the election. So we don't <laughs> exactly. Know. Well, yeah, yeah, we don't even know the outcome. The one thing we do know is that the polls are way off. That's the one thing, no matter how it yeah. quite turns out, we know the polls are going to be way off. Um, and the reason is because people, 
imagine a poll is just literally you've gotten a representative sample of people. It's relevantly representative. And so it tells you what people are going to do. In fact, they're very complex statistical models that are only as good as the assumptions that are plugged into them. And when well, you're not only to... that, they're only as good as the people answering the polling, the pollsters. <laughs> and absolutely, as, I knew in 2016 a lot of people just wouldn't admit they're Trump fans that's right. because they just don't no, want right. to be vilified. They don't want to be called a racist. These are these yep. are things used to suppress free speech, yep. these tactics that the left uses. It's absolutely appalling, but that's we, it is. We are where we are, right? No, that's right. And so any good poll, any model would have taken tried to take account of the so-called shy Trump vote. But we knew the pollsters, for the most part, just simply ignored that. And so uh, we'll have another one of these reckonings where everybody says, OK, we've got to do better next time. But I think what we need to do is step back and just apply a little more skepticism about the ability of these complex statistical models embedded with assumptions to really capture reality. I think they, they tend to be tools for, frankly, controlling the population, uh, whether sure. you're talking about the pandemic or the election, rather than tools to accurately model reality. And that's that's the problem because we think, look, the lockdowns happen more or less because of this belief that these models represented reality. And so it's as if we are cut off our heads to get rid of a headache. There would have been a much more focused strategy that would have been much better with fewer consequences if we'd focused on the population that was most at risk and not lock down school children and everyone else. But unfortunately, yeah. and, that's, and you know, you could argue happened. that it's actually really hurt that at risk population because we've squandered resources into the yes. general population that didn't need those resources. And of course, no one has tabulated the, yeah, you know, I like to talk about you can't hear the dogs that don't bark. No yes. one has really tabulated, although a few have m mentioned it in passing. Mm -hmm you know, the suicides, the depression, the, oh, yeah. uh, you know, the lack of people going to the doctor for a regular checkup that let a cancer grow or another disease grow or heart disease grow. And, and, you yep. know, those people have suffered or died. You know, there's just, there's just no data on that, right? So we did the best that we could in the book. We tried to uh, basically calculate what's the price of the panic financially and in terms of, of lives lost. Uh, we think at the moment, something like 75,000, there'll be 75,000 and excess deaths of despair in the United States in 2020. So that's suicide and drug and alcohol overdose, 75,000. We think that, you know, wow. that, that's the kind of general ballpark, probably about 80,000 miss cancer screenings just in that first three months of the lockdowns. Yeah. And so that gives you a sense of the kind of magnitude that very quickly, the just the response, the lockdowns themselves could end up killing more people than are attributed to the coronavirus. That's the very definition of a bad well, policy. And, and also the attribution to coronavirus is, is fake, largely. So yeah, that's, it's very that's... complex. But the difference between dying with the coronavirus and, and from it, yeah. uh, unfortunately, get conflated. Cases get conflated with mere positive tests and infections. It really is a mess. And so we wanted to look, we knew we couldn't stop it. Uh, we can't change the past, but we really wanted to try to prevent a lockdown again in 2021, which is what we're now talking about, unfortunately. And if we see uh, Biden take over, we're probably going to have a lot more lockdowns. You know, let's talk about coordination and conspiracy for a moment. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I think we're all realizing the powers that be have a lot of advantages that have come out of this crisis. You know, like uh, Winston Churchill mm -hmm. said, don't let a good crisis go to waste. But <laughs> I'm a man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> so talk about two sides of the political spectrum right there. But, you know, how could they have ever coordinated such a thing? I mean, was it just such a happy opportunity for them? And I say happy in a snarky yeah. way, but sure. you know, did, did this come around and, and like, you know, someone made a call to the WHO and said, Hey, mm -hmm. you got to make this a panic. And, and then they, you know, reached out to all these media outlets or started putting out press releases and, you know, started working with the CDC and Fauci to 
freak everyone out or or what how would that have happened yeah well and so that was the thing you know we 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 wanted to try to account for is why exactly did the panic happen what what would it best explain it we don't think it requires any kind of centralized coordination but it did require a kind of group think among a very small number uh, of people in the public health sort of bureaucracy the world health organization is the un's arm for public health and you've got the cdc and you've got dr anthony fauci here uh, in, in the U.S., they all think exactly alike. And then we learned in mid-spring that the World Health Organization was frankly carrying water for Beijing, for the People's Republic of China and the authorities there. And then the, there was this idea of a lockdown as that was a hypothesis. The, the way that we responded from time immemorial with pandemics is quarantines in which you, you lock down and protect, you know, quarantine the people that are sick and try to isolate the people that are high risk. This idea of a general lockdown though, in the 2000s, it became this new idea that maybe this would work, these population lockdowns, though even the World Health Organization in 2019 said there's no good evidence that they would actually, they would actually work. They thought it probably wouldn't pr prevent the spread and it would cause these all this harm. But in March, in the middle of the panic, which I really think was a combination of the media's incentives, which is always to panic us because that's more interesting and people want to click through and you see a scary story. And then the capacity of social media to really magnify and amplify the the panicking effects uh, of 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 the media itself. And so this is in some ways the first panic since we've had this real time access to social media. Um, and so once the pandemic, once a sort of new virus happened, all these pieces were sort of in place to trigger a planetary lockdown, which is what we actually had. But it really, I think more than anything, it's just it's a matter of groupthink. And then what we call the tyranny of experts in which you have a few highly specialized uh, technicians, right? Scientists with the, the legitimate expertise in a very narrow field, but they have an unbalanced access to the, the ears of prime ministers and presidents. And that's what we think we have to fix. In, in the future, uh, presidents and prime ministers and governors need to be able to get uh, a kind of representative sample of the diversity of opinion among scientists when it comes to these things. So they don't just think the one guy, Dr. Anthony Fauci, somehow speaks for science, which is unfortunately what we had happen in this case. So the tyranny of experts, is that your phrase or has that been used before? It's not widely used, but the phrase is, it was sort of in circulation. And the basic idea is not, the problem isn't expertise, of course, it's a complex word, world, you need people to be experts in specialties. The danger is when somebody who's a specialized expert in a narrow field ends up with jurisdiction over areas over which he or she has no competence. So Dr. Anthony Fauci, okay, he's an immunologist. So, you know, that's his expertise. He has absolutely no expertise in analyzing the costs and benefits of a public policy in which you lock the population down. That's a different expertise. That's something that you'd want an economist or somebody to analyze. Fauci didn't understand that. And in fact, when he was asked, look, maybe we don't want the cure to be worse than disease. So I understand lockdowns will be an inconvenience. Well, this is this is the sign of a very naive person that doesn't understand that, no, when you radically disrupt the economy, you kill people. It actually, human lives are at stake. And so it was always lives on either Either side. And that's the danger is he or Dr. Tedros, the director general of the World Health Organization. Uh, these guys are not experts in the effects of the policies that they advised. Um, they, they just outside the, their expertise, they don't know anything more than anybody else did. And that's what we call the theory of experts. When a few specialists end up making decisions over large numbers of people uh, over which they really have no business. Um, they, they, we don't, they, that's not what these kinds of experts are for. Unfortunately, in this case, rather than being one of 25 experts that would advise a president or a prime minister, the media elevated them so that they became, it's like they had the status of these infallible oracles. So that if Dr. Anthony Fauci said something, well, that was just the sort of thing that nobody could challenge. That's that's what changed, I think, in the middle of the crisis is these, what would otherwise be kind of obscure experts, suddenly are these media figures that nobody can challenge. That's, that's a really dangerous thing to have happen. Yeah, it, it it really is. It really is. But it's it's just, yeah. Wow. It's it's amazing how this thing played out. It really is amazing. And you know, you look at a seventy four year old man who mm -hmm. is obviously busy and stressed out. Who got it right? He was infected mm -hmm. with COVID, and 
obviously he had good medical care, but he recovered so quickly. It was truly amazing. And his, his name's President Donald Trump. And I knew he was, honestly, he's robust. Anybody that watches him for 15 minutes knows but, this but guy. He, I don't he's know. He's overweight. He's stressed. Yeah, he is. And he's 74. Yeah. Okay. I know exactly. So those tri the, those criteria, you'd think, okay, he's really high risk. On the other hand, he's clearly kind of a force of nature with a lot of energy. Now, there's no way to know whether the treatment made a difference or if he would have recovered without it. We we can't know. But I honestly, I I knew at the beginning. I thought, oh boy, okay, I, he's going to be fine. And and sure enough, he is. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's re it's really something. So where do we go from here on the price of panic? And then let's switch gears for a moment. Yeah, I. I think where we go from here is, first of all, we need to learn the lessons. We need to learn that, look, we do not want to put our faith in these speculative models that have not been tested against reality. Models that have gotten tested so that we know the assumptions fit the evidence, that's fine. But in this case, the, the assumptions that were plugged into this original model at the Imperial College London wasn't really based on anything. And so it should never have been used as a tool for guiding public policy. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is that we need to um, downgrade the authority of experts like Dr. Fauci uh, so that they're, that, frankly, the presidents aren't being told by one person or effectively, as President Trump said in April, two very smart people came into my office and told me 2.2 million people will be dead unless we lock down the country. Uh, that's not how it should be. They got that number straight from that computer model. And then two people tell the president something and he has to act upon on it, that, that we need to set things up so there's a kind of loyal opposition, a body of scientists who are independent of the administrative state who can advise political leaders without the kind of incentives of people that are that are government bureaucrats, unfortunate, sure, unfortunately. Yeah. And so, yeah, I agree. but honestly, persuading the population that this was a mistake and we don't want to do a lockdown again, that's what I've been spending my last few weeks doing, is just trying to persuade as many people as I can that, look, we do not want to do this again. You know, there seems to be, and I'm going to call it a disease because I think it is a disease, a sort of a, a psychological disease that I've noticed on the left side of the political aisle. And mm -hmm. that is this concept of you need an academician for everything. You need a study. Right. It's like I was having this debate with a friend of mine on Facebook. I indulge in these once in a while today. And, you know, she's telling me that, you know, all of these riots are full of Trump supporters and white supremacists and all this stuff. And, and she starts posting all these articles, right, mm -hmm. about it. And yeah, I'm sure there were like three of them at those of course, riots, sure. okay, around the country, <laughs> three. And, yeah. and, and then I simply, you know, I simply search it and find a bunch of pictures. And I've already seen these pictures and these videos on every, you know, largely left-leaning media outlet. It's, mm -hmm. you know, and I said, you don't need an article. You just need to use your eyes and your ears. Right. The, the reporters right. have stuck microphones in front of these people and they've spoken in Chaz or in Seattle sure. and, and all these places. They're, yeah, I mean, are you going to sit here and tell me that these look like or talk like these are Republicans? <laughs> are you, are you, <laughs> are you going to believe your li believe yeah. me or your lying eyes effectively? Yeah, yeah but, I mean, but it's... you know, she's got a couple of articles, so, you know, yeah. and it's like, why do people rely on some biased study, an article, a, a report, a treatise? Mm -hmm to talk them out of what is right in front of them and just common sense. It's a strange well, phenomenon. I know it's common sense, unfortunately, is not as common as it should be because, um, you know, we got this uh, in the lead up to the election. I mean, okay, you've got these massive rallies that President Trump is doing. Uh, Joe Biden is has a hard, you know, has a hard time drawing, drawing crickets. And yet we're told that he's going to, you know, he's going to beat Trump by 12 points based upon these speculative models that we treated that as data. Right. But what we're actually seeing is if it wasn't data. And that's honestly, I think we need we need more faith in discernment and in common sense. But there is this kind of tendency to assume, well, uh, yeah, again, it's a form of the tyranny of experts in which oh, I, I have a study that tells me uh, how this is going to go. And so it has the sort of pretense of knowledge yeah. and or, academic or respectability without so. its content. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly.
it's just absolutely crazy. Okay, uh, let's switch gears for a moment and, and we'll, we'll start wrapping it up here. But I just want to briefly touch on the idea of infiltrated, you know, how the insiders and the activists exploit financial crises to gain control. It's related to this yeah. topic. Absolutely. I mean, in, infiltrated is a sort of narrative history of what happened behind the scenes with the financial crisis, because everybody within now two you're weeks talking of about the 2008 two thousand eight financial exactly crisis. the two thousand eight financial crisis. For anybody those that remember it, within two weeks the media told us, "Oh, it was the result of deregulation and uh, capitalism run amok and the free market and all these things." But if you actually look at it in detail, you realize no. And what happened is a series of maybe well-meaning government policies, which over d really decades destroyed the underwriting standards on loans. So that at the time of the crisis, 50% of the mortgages in the mortgage market were subprime or otherwise risky loans. These are loans that could never have been given, you know, 30 or 40 years prior to that. It would have simply been uh, in contra contrary to the law. But there had been actually a political push to, to give out these, these risky loans. And then of course, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were buying up these loans from private bankers. And so I realized, look, this is actually the result of a series of, of bad policy decisions, uh, not the free market itself. In a free market, a banker does not give out a loan unless he thinks you're gonna be able to repay it. So how, why were banks giving out loans uh, in danger of default? Well, it's because of the system in which they're able to sell the loan upstream, right, to someone yeah. else. And so that's because because of that story, though, that it was really the result of the free market, we ended up with even more uh, onerous regulations. So we ended up with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, right, which gets down even and more into the weeds. Yeah, and Dodd-Frank, exactly. Um, and so, so these really bad kind of, you know, we get a series of regulations, maybe well-meaning, that leads to a crisis. And then the crisis becomes a justification for even more government power, right? Uh, and so this is the kind of what I call the, the, the danger of crony capitalism as opposed to plain socialism. It looks like it's free market actors that are doing things. It's not. And it's the, kind of gov it's the government behind the scenes. Whereas in socialism, at least you know the government directly owns the factories. Cronyism, mm -hmm. it's subtler because right. look, the, the government's back there controlling a lot of what you're seeing. But you know, the, the, if something goes wrong, they can blame private industry rather than the policy. And I think right. that's what so the happened government with the financial gets the crisis. control, but they get to displace the blame. And right exactly. now you see this with the social media companies that are government backed, yep. either financially at their startup yes. stage, or they're backed now by allowing them to lobby and gain uh, favoritism, uh, whereas they yeah. re they return the favor for the government, they squelch free speech, which the government is not allowed to do, but a private company can no. do it. So no, and they can. And the problem with the social they, media they giants the, is they, they also use the social media companies as proxies for yeah. government speech oppression. Yeah. yeah, and what's weird is, of course, they have this benefit, the so-called uh, Section 230 of the Communications yeah. Decency Act, in which the platforms are treated like neutral platforms, so they yeah. can't be sued I like know. a publisher, but then they get to exercise editorial discretion just like a publisher. And so I think that's the way to solve that regulatorily, is that they need to decide, okay, you're going to be a neutral platform, or are you going to be a publisher? Right now, they're, they get to have their Even if they never too. publish one piece of their own content, they are media outlets just yes. like CNN and the New York Times and all the rest and should have liability because they can decide what gets seen and what doesn't. And that That's is right. editorializing in and of itself. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And, and now my prediction is what's going to come next is we're seeing a rush toward digital dollar a digital yuan, mm. um, you mm -hmm. know, and governments are rushing to their own cryptocurrency, which is going to give them incredible control over our lives. Mm -hmm. And we should do a whole nother show on that. Let's have you back sure. to talk about that <laughs> and automation and the future of automation, because Absolutely. I think those are two really important topics. Jay, give out your website. Absolutely. So you can uh, check me out actually at stream.org, uh, where I write frequently. And also my Twitter is at Dr. Jay Richards. If you're not censored. <laughs> if I'm not censored, and sometimes yeah. I am, I'll tell you. So. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, Jack Dorsey is happy to censor anybody he doesn't agree with. So we <laughs> right, definitely learned that. Uh, Jay, thanks so much for fighting the good fight and joining us today. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Great to be with you.